to sing of Jesus Christ, the risen one. Did you feel the people tremble? Did you hear the singers roar? When the lost began to sing of Jesus Christ, the saving
In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone who took on flesh Fullness of God in helpless bed This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on the cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live There in the ground his body lay Light of the world by darkness slain
Good morning and welcome to Breton Baptist Church Online. My name is Pastor Brian and it is my privilege to welcome you to our service this morning. I'm smiling a little bit because I've tried this recording goodness knows how many times and I keep either messing up or getting interruptions. And the last interruption was a, a doorbell ring and my dog going absolutely berserk. So I'm going to run through this one regardless of any errors, regardless of any interruptions. So please bear with me. Today we are going to be blessed through the teaching and preaching of Ray Markham as he continues the series that we've embarked on since last week, Unlikely People in God's Story. I don't know about you, but I've always felt like an unlikely person in the story of God, in the mission of God, in the movement people of God. So I'm really excited about this series and the different preachers that are going to come and share what God is placing on their hearts through the different scriptures that we're going to look into. Now, we are obviously only touching on these characters in the Bible. We're going to be looking at um, some of the familiar ones and unfamiliar ones. Ray Markham has done a wonderful book on the cast in the Old Testament, which I would encourage you if you haven't got a copy already or not rest read it but he looks at some of the lesser known characters in the old testament so we're going through the old testament first i don't know how long we'll do that for but we'll do it as long as we believe the lord is guiding us in that but if you want some more recommendations of different readings i can't remember if i have recommended this book to you in the past but uh, for those that want to just draw closer to God in their spiritual journey, Sacred Ribbons by Ruth Haley Barton is worth a read. Um, forgive me if I have um, recommended this book before, but I can't remember. So I'm doing it again just for those that want some inspirational reading. My heart for all of us is to get closer to God. Whatever you're going through, however you're finding life, whatever, however dark it is, however desperate it is, however dangerous it is however i don't know whatever wherever you are in it getting closer to god there is nothing else more powerful um, that can help you through your healing through your wholeness and through your freedom god just invites us to come close and we're going to do that in just a moment but before we get started before we gather together as god scattered people in a time of sung worship and to receive the nourishment from heaven let me just uh, uh, share with you a couple of things that might be helpful for you during this service if you're here for the first time welcome it's lovely to have you with us if you would like to give us a shout out in the live public uh, chat room feel free to do that and our host will greet you and welcome you if you want to connect with us and not have done so far, then please click on the link or contact the office or one of us if you have the in, uh, telephone numbers. They are on the website. Please check out our weekly bulletin. Um, if you don't receive that, please sign up for that. Uh, but that tells you what's going on in the church. Anytime during the service, you can use the live prayer room where there's a couple of people there ready to listen and pray with you. And um, that will be left open till about 10 past um, 10 minutes after the service. Immediately after service, we have a chill and chat, which you are very welcome to come along. It's great to see you. Um, I'm missing getting to see people. Please come just so I can see you. If you've not attended before um, and are able to, please come along. I'd love to see you. We just spend about 15 minutes uh, chatting together. And tonight we have the prayer, praise and prophecy. So please join us for that. I am excited about these next few weeks because we're doing hybrid services, we're doing outdoor services, and we're preparing to get back into the church for the 27th of June. I am really keen for that to happen. Please continue to pray for us. Please continue to um, be a part of what God is doing. And please keep connected at all times. We have a dual responsibility to encourage each other, to, to spur each other on, to build each other up in the Lord. Um, and it's a two way thing. Please do not stay disconnected. Always remain connected. OK, let us get in to some worship. I've got so far without any interruptions. Um, and let me just lead us into a time of scattered, gathered worship. The psalmist says in verse four of chapter 30. Sing the praises of the Lord, you, his faithful 
people. Praise his holy name. That's all we need to do as we come into a time of sung worship. Father, we lift our hearts to you. We're going to lift our voices to you. We're going to lift our hands to you. We're going to come to you just as we are, just as we feel comfortable, just as we feel daring. Father, receive us now as a living sacrifice. Receive us and fill us afresh with the power of your Holy Spirit. Let us not hold back in coming closer to you. Let us draw nearer to you and discover a greater depth of your wholeness, of your healing and of your freedom. Father, we come to you with our offering. Lord, we lay that before you, ourselves and all that we're willing to give back to you. Father, we thank you for the giving in this church. We thank you for the service in this church. We thank you for the unsung heroes in this church. We thank you for those people that feel like unlikely people in God's story. We thank you for those people that do so much in the church that are not known. Father, we are a blessed church. Help us to return our blessing back to you and to each other. Receive us now and help us to worship you in ways that we've never worshipped before. This we pray in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us worship.
Praise to 
I'm Shane Claiborne and I have a special invitation for you. I want to invite you to join us uh, May 13th through the 16th for the Baptist Assembly over in the UK and everyone is welcome. It's going to be a virtual event. You can join from anywhere. Uh, if you don't have money, you don't have to give. If you have money, we welcome it. But we're going to be gathering uh, to talk about our faith and how it connects to the world that we live in. Our theme this year will be heal our hearts, heal our streets, heal our world. Don't you know that we need healing in our hearts and throughout the world? That's what we're going to be talking about. Join us May 13th through the 16th. You can go to baptistassembly.org.uk. I hope I get to see you.
Good morning, Britain. And let's pray. Thank you, Father, for giving us time to come and worship you. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for coming down from heaven to earth to show us how to live life, to show us how to walk your ways, to show us how to bless others and love others. Thank you, Father, for dying on the cross, for you died for our sins so that we can be called your own. You are holy, the anointed one, our savior, our redeemer, our healer, the one who heal all our diseases. I pray for the sick. Father, I pray that you may stretch your healing hand upon the sick, that they may know that you are Jehovah Rapha. I pray for the lost, that they may hear your voice calling them. Father, open their spiritual ears that they may hear you, declaring your love upon them. Father, I pray for those who are journeying with you already, that they may feel thy presence wherever they go, in our comings and our goings. May you blanket us with thy spirit. May you teach us how to walk your ways. May you teach us how to love like God, like you do. I pray, Almighty Father, that your love abound in us, that it may overflow unto the, into the community. Father, I pray for the church. Build your church. Be with those ones who are serving. Guard them, bind them by your side. Lead them, Almighty Father, with thy mighty hand. We thank you, Almighty One, for your grace, for your mercies. Father, I pray for family, our families. I pray for protection, that you protect us from evil one, from diseases, incidents, accidents. I pray for blessings. Let it rain upon us. Bless our children, our families, and the next generation, and the next generation. I pray for those who are in the government, that they may lead with thy grace, with thy love. Father, I pray that each and every person who is here will listen to thy word and understand your thoughts and your will upon their lives and upon this world. I put everyone in thy potter's hand. Mold us according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. The birth of Isaac. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears will about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Hagar and Ishmael sent away. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. 
But Sarah saw how the son, whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham, was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a great a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God came, called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. Good morning, everybody. Today, we're going to be looking at the life of Hagar, a downtrodden servant girl who, despite her circumstances, met with God in a marvelous way and became the mother of nations. So turn with me to Genesis 16 and let's see how her story unfolds and what we can learn from it. To understand what happens to her, we need to be aware of something that happened several years previously. You can read about it in Genesis 15, verses 4 and 6. And there you will see that God had promised Abram a son. And for years and years, Abram and Sarai, or Sarai, as some people pronounce it, they held on in faith, believing that this promise would come to pass. And yet, nothing happened. So Sarai decides to give God a helping hand. Let's look at verse 1 of chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. They'd actually acquired Hagar some years ago during their time they spent in Egypt, which I suppose you could describe as a rather undistinguished but profitable time. And you can read about it in Genesis chapter 12, verses 10 to 20. Her name, Hagar, was actually not an Egyptian name, however. And it seems to be that Abram actually gave her this name. Her name means flight. It means flight or runaway. And the possible reason Abram gave it to her was that that's exactly what she did. Could have been that when she heard that they were going to leave the comforts of Egypt and move up north and, and follow a nomadic lifestyle, she wasn't too keen, and so she ran away, hence her name. Let's move on to verses 2 to 6. 
So Sarai said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai ill-treated Hagar, and she fled from her. This solution that Sarai proposed was not dreamt up by her. It was in fact a custom that was frequently used back in their home country of Chaldea and in the city of Ur, where they came from. Abram and Sarai were their Chaldean names. Any child thus born to a slave girl was considered as the wife's own child if she had no children of her own. That was the custom of the times and the area in which they came from. So Hagar is to be the surrogate mother. Let's just pause a moment and imagine Hagar's feelings. She has no choice about this. She's just a mere servant. Verse 3 tells us that she's forced into a loveless, unattractive marriage of convenience at Sarai's convenience and for Sarai's convenience. Her only joy is becoming pregnant. And when she does, she decides it's payback time. So she taunts her mistress. I'm pregnant, you're not. Na 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 na. Sure you can make up the rest. So this call so-called solution causes a right bust up. And who does Sarai blame? Well, she blames Abram. Remind me whose idea it was? Verse 5 actually reminds me of a birthday card I saw recently, and it contained these words, and I quote, Behind every angry woman stands a man who has absolutely no idea what he did wrong. Sums up Abram's situation, I think, here. So what does Abram do about the situation, about this strife that's arisen in his family? He does absolutely nothing. He doesn't seem to feel he has any responsibility for what's going on between his two wives. And he tells Sarai to sort it out herself. And Sarai does exactly that. She's so cruel to Hagar that Hagar lives up to her name. She runs away. She takes flight, presumably in the direction of Egypt. Now I wonder this morning, like Hagar, do we tend to run away when problems occur? In my experience, that's so much easier to do, but it tends to produce more problems. It's also my experience that we grow more in God as we face up to things through his grace and strength rather than take off at high speed in the opposite direction. What a terrible place Hagar finds herself in, both physically and emotionally. But she is about to experience God's mercy, 
God's grace and God's love in such a powerful way in spite of her circumstances. And this is a key thought this morning, a key thought to remember. In spite of her circumstances, she's going to experience God's mercy, his grace, and his love. Let's see how. Verse 7 to 10. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from? And where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. And the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will become too numerous to count. Isn't this interesting that the angel appears not to Abram, not to Sarai, but he appears to Hagar, the one who is most bruised and most needy. What grace, what mercy, what love. The angel comes right where she is in her distress, even though she's not where she should be. She should be back in the camp but she's on the road to Egypt. But in spite of that, God shows her his grace, his mercy, and his love. And praise God this morning. His presence, his ministry, his blessing in our lives is never affected by the circumstances we find ourselves in. He doesn't turn his back on us or forsake us, or abandon us, no matter what's brought us to this situation. No matter what's brought us, if you like, to this desert place in our lives. Whether we're here due to our own actions, or due to the actions of others. This is what Hagar's experiences teach us, as we'll continue to see. In verse 9, to stop Hagar making another mistake, what does the angel tell her to do? The angel tells her to go back to Sarai. And not just to go back and pick up where she left off, but to go back and submit to her. Make a U-turn, Hagar is what the angel is saying. Make a U-turn. The solution is not in Egypt. The solution is back where she's run from. Must have been very difficult for Hagar to accept this, to go back, the thought of going back to Sarah and submitting. It was a lot easier to keep on running back to Egypt her attitude was going to have to change. That was the cost of keeping God's blessing, God's joy and God's peace in her life. But to her credit, Hagar listens and she returns to the camp. It's an interesting thought, I think, that if she hadn't gone back, Abraham would never have had the joy of naming his firstborn son Ishmael. And Ishmael means God hears. He'd never have had that joy, or the joy of watching Ishmael, his firstborn son, grow up. And that shows us, you know, that our decisions, that our actions will affect other people too. So let me ask you, do we need, you, me, do we need to make a U-turn 
and face up to problems we've been running away from, maybe for years? Do we need to change our attitude and be reconciled to someone? That's someone we've pushed away years ago. That's someone we had an upset with and we've just never done anything about it. Maybe we need to be reconciled. Or do we need to submit to God and accept where he has placed us? Whether we like being there or not, God has placed us somewhere. And let's remember that wherever God has placed us, we have a task to perform because we are God's ambassadors in that place. Let's move on to verses 13 to 16. Hagar gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Be'er Lehei Roy. It, it is still there between Kadesh and Bered. He sees me. Hagar is overwhelmed by God's loving care, particularly after the way she's behaved, which she probably full well realizes. And so she named the well in memory of her experience of God. She called it Well of the Living One Who Sees Me. She may have thought, who sees little insignificant me. The Almighty God sees me. And isn't it wonderful to know, wonderful to know that none of us, not one of us, is too insignificant to be seen by God. Others may think we're insignificant. God never does. You are not insignificant. You are so significant to God that Jesus came and died on the cross for you so that you can know him. We now leap forward 15 years. And during that 15 years, God has confirmed his promise of a son for Abram and Sarai. And as an assurance of that promise, he has renamed them into the more familiar Abraham and Sarah. And you can read about that in chapter 17, verses 5, 15, and 16. And eventually, Isaac was born. So let's pick up the story in chapter 21, starting at verse 8. Chapter 21, starting at verse 8. The child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your maidservant. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the maidservant into a nation also, because he is your offspring." Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down nearby, about a bowshot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. 
And as she sat there nearby, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. And of course, that was the nation of the Arab peoples. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. Just think about what we've just read. Whatever was Ishmael actually doing? That's what I've always wondered. Whatever was he actually doing? Was he not simply just a 15-year-old lad messing about at a party, being stupid, a bit like my two 15-year-old grandsons are wont to do? Or was he being maybe disdainful of Isaac as Abraham's heir, perhaps saying he was the rightful heir? We'll never know, but whatever it was, Hagar finds herself back in the desert place. At this time, it's not her fault. God hears Hagar's sobs. God hears, remember, that's what Ishmael's name actually means. God hears, what a wonderful reminder that has been to Hagar throughout her life. Every time she called his name, she would remember what it meant and she would remember how the angel of the Lord came to her as she was running away to Egypt. God hears Hagar's sobs and hears Ishmael's crying and the angel opens Hagar's eyes to see his merciful provision of water. God provided water to meet their physical needs, but he has also mercifully and graciously provided Jesus the living water to meet all our spiritual needs. As he explained to another woman, also cast out, also sitting by a well, this time in Samaria. And you know this morning, we need to grasp this truth, that Jesus died to enable you, to enable me, to drink freely of this water of life, bringing his forgiveness, his love, his joy, his peace, and his healing into your life. And if you want to do that, if you want to drink of this water of life, please speak to someone about it and ask them to pray with you. In conclusion then, Let's summarize what we've learned this morning in a prayer. And as we do so, let me encourage you to respond in your heart. To respond with joy, with faith, with trust, with thanksgiving, with whatever is appropriate for wherever you find yourself right now. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord for the lessons we can learn from the experiences of Hagar. Help us to remember that no matter the circumstances we find ourselves in today or any day, you will still meet with us. You will still use us. You will still bless us. You will still speak to us. You will still care for us. You will still provide for us. You will still show us your wondrous grace, your never-ending mercy, and your unfailing love. Hallelujah. Praise your glorious name. Amen. You come.
Sadly, we've come to the end of our time of scattered, gathered worship. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Ray, for the word shared. Thank you for the worship team and the pre-recordings. Thank you for the team that sits behind the technology to get this service into the quality that we are becoming accustomed to. Such great quality. Thank you for our hosts and our prayer team. Thank you for all those that make this happen. It requires a lot more work than coming and rocking up at church. Father, we thank you and are blessed because of you and your faithful people. Please join us if you can for the um, chill and chat in the Zoom room. Uh, please use the prayer room if you um, were intending to and feel in the need for prayer. And please come and join us tonight at 7.30 at a prayer, praise and prophecy. But for now, until we meet again, let us remember the words in chapter one of Joshua. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Remember, God is only as far from you as you walk away from him. Stay close to him, for he is close to you. Further from us, he could not be yet nearer to us than we are to ourselves. May God continue to shine through you. May you be lifted up and built up in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go and serve him, worship him at all times, in all places, under all circumstances. Until we meet again, God bless you.